Chapter Seven, Part A, of A B C of Vegetable Gardening. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Seven, Part A. Standard Varieties of Vegetables. The amateur gardener will find it extremely perplexing work to make a satisfactory selection of varieties of vegetables to grow in his garden. He knows quite well, as a general thing, what kinds he wants to grow, but when he comes to a consultation of the seedsmen's catalogues, he discovers that of each kind of vegetable listed therein there are so many varieties mentioned that he is bewildered. Most of them are described as being so desirable that he cannot help getting the impression that if he rules out this or that one he is likely to deprive himself of the very thing from which he would obtain the highest degree of satisfaction. Nine times out of ten he finds, after going through the catalogues and marking the kinds and varieties that appeal to him most forcibly, that he has a list which would furnish enough seed to supply an average-sized market garden. I would advise the amateur gardener to attempt the culture of only a few of the many varieties described in the catalogues, and these of the very best. But what constitutes the very best is a hard matter for him to decide where all are described by adjectives in the superlative degree. He will find, by comparing the catalogues of the various seed firms, that there are described in most of them certain varieties of each kind of vegetable that seem common to all, along with many other varieties whose names differ greatly, though the descriptions of them indicate that there is not much difference in quality, or in other general respects. If he confines his selection to such varieties of each kind as the various dealers list under the same names in their catalogues, he will be making no mistake, for the fact that all leading dealers carry these varieties in stock is sufficient proof that they are standard varieties, and of such superior merit that no up-to-date dealer can afford to exclude them from his list. Take for instance Stowell's Evergreen Sweet Corn and Champion of England Pea. All dealers handle these, because they are standard, and always in demand because their superior qualities have made them universal favorites wherever grown. But they have other varieties of the same vegetable of which each makes a specialty, under names which will be found in no catalogue but their own. Many of these are doubtless possessors of all the good qualities claimed for them, but this we cannot be sure about. But the sorts which are common to all are those of whose merit there can be no two opinions. These are the varieties the inexperienced gardener can select with the assurance that he is getting the best thing of its kind on the market. In this chapter I propose to make mention of only such kinds of vegetables as I have grown in my own garden. I do this because so many beginners in gardening prefer to depend on the advice of someone who has familiarized himself with the merits of the various vegetables adapted to ordinary gardening and I propose to give with each such brief cultural directions as seem of most importance, thus making it possible for the amateur to avoid some of the mistakes that might be made if he were wholly ignorant of the requirements of his plants. After having experimented with many kinds I have pinned my faith to the kinds I shall make mention of, and I have no hesitancy in recommending them to the attention of all gardeners, feeling confident that a trial of them will bear me out in the statement that no better list can be made. There may be others of equal or superior merit, but if there are, I have still to find out what they are. ASPARAGUS Taking the list alphabetically, the first vegetable to consider is asparagus. Conover's Colossal seems to combine all the merits of the several varieties on the market, in such a degree as to give it a place at the head of the list of desirable kinds for ordinary garden culture. It is tender, fine-flavored, and very productive. A dozen plants, after becoming well established, will furnish all that will be required by a family of four or five persons. In order to secure good crops for this delicious vegetable, it will be necessary to dig up the soil in which it is to be planted to the depth of two or three feet, and fill the bottom of the excavation with strong manure. Pack this down firmly, and then return to the trench the soil thrown out from it, fertilizing this well as you do so, while asparagus will grow in a soil that is not at all rich, and will live on indefinitely under all kinds of neglect and abuse. It must be given plenty of strong food and good care in order to enable it to do itself justice. 
I would not advise attempting to grow it from seed, as it takes a long time for seedling plants to reach maturity. I would get two or three-year-old plants. Set them about eighteen inches apart and at least four inches below the surface. Keep weeds and grass away from them. Give the asparagus bed a place in the garden by itself, preferably along a fence or in some location where it will not interfere with other plants which call for the frequent use of the garden cultivator. On no account plant it in that part of the garden where it will be necessary to use a plow, for it is a plant that must be left undisturbed if you would have it do its best. Cover the beds with coarse manure in the fall, and work this into the soil about the plants in spring. Beans Mammoth stringless green pod matures early, and is very tender, fine-flavored, and productive. It is a general favorite for the home garden. Golden wax is later than the green potted variety mentioned above. It is valuable as a string bean and for shelling. Beans are quite tender, therefore they should not be planted until the weather becomes warm and settled. Plant in rows two feet apart and about four inches apart in the row, or in hills of three or four plants each. Cultivate frequently during the early part of summer, throwing the soil toward the plants. Do not work among them while they are wet from dew or rain. If a pole bean is wanted, improved lima will be found extremely satisfactory because of its productiveness and its fine, buttery flavor. This class supplies the table with shelled beans only, its pods being too tough to use as a string bean. Plant in hills of six or eight, setting a pole six or seven feet tall in the center of each hill for the plants to climb by. Beet I would advise two varieties of this vegetable where the garden is large enough to warrant the use of more than one. Crosby's Egyptian stands at the head of the list as an early variety. It is remarkably tender and has a sugary flavor that is most delicious. As a second variety I would advise Crimson Globe. This is very sweet and fine flavored and comes to perfection during the latter part of summer. It is a good keeper, and a quantity of it should be stored in the cellar for winter use. Sow seeds in rows sixteen to eighteen inches apart, sow thickly, and use the surplus plants as greens while young and tender, making use of both top and root, thin to three or four inches apart. Cabbage Unless the garden is of considerable size, I would not advise planting this vegetable, because it takes up so much room that might be better given to other kinds which the housewife will find more useful. The plants should stand at least two feet apart. Seed can be put into the ground about the first of May, or plants can be started in the hotbed if wanted for very early use. Seedlings can be transplanted as soon as they have made their second leaf. For a very early variety, I would advise Jersey Wakefield. For late use, late drumhead or stonemason marblehead, both excellent in all respects and fine for winter use. Care must be taken to prevent insects from injuring the plants during the various stages of their development. Stray with an infusion of the tobacco extract known as nicoticide. This will effectually prevent the pests from doing harm if applied thoroughly and frequently. If cabbage is to be wintered in the cellar, it must be kept cool and dry. Some prefer to bury the heads in trenches in dry locations in the garden. The trench should be about two feet deep. Spread straw in the bottom of it, and place the cabbage on it, head down, with the large leaves folded well together. Then cover with three or four inches of hay, and bank up with soil. Put a board over this to shed rain. The cabbage will freeze but if left in the ground until the frost is gradually extracted from it, it will be found crisp and brittle, and much more satisfactory for table use than that which is wintered in the cellar. Care must be taken to exclude rain. If water gets to it, it will be ruined. It is a good plan to cover the trench with oilcloth or tarred paper, both being waterproof. Cauliflower this is a favored vegetable when well grown and properly cared for. It requires a rich soil, a location well exposed to the sun, and frequent applications of water if the season happens to be a dry one. Cultivate as you would cabbage. For early use the plants should be started in the hotbed, and transplanted to the cold frame as soon as they have made their third leaves. Put into the open ground as soon as the soil is in good working condition. Set the plants about two feet apart. When heads have formed, they should be bleached by drawing the large leaves together and tying them with strips of soft cloth. 
For a late crop, to mature during the pickling season, start plants in open ground in May. The best early variety is Dwarf Erfurt. Autumn Giant is an excellent late variety. Carrot. This plant likes a deep, warm, sandy soil. Early shorthorn matures by midsummer. It is rich and sweet in flavor. Red Intermediate is a later variety excellent for fall and winter use. Comparatively few persons give this plant a place in their gardens, but it richly deserves a place there because of its value as an article of food, as well as because of its health-giving qualities. It adds greatly to the variety of the bill of fare, and where it appears frequently on the table, a liking for it is soon developed, and thereafter it becomes a standard vegetable in the housewife's list of must-haves. It adds a delightful flavor to vegetable soups. Celery the seed of early celery should be sown in the hotbed. Transplant the seedlings to the cold frame, and allow them to remain there until May. Then set in the richest soil at your disposal, six inches apart in the row. Blanch by setting up boards a foot or more in width each side of the row, allowing an opening about three inches wide at the top through which the plants can get a little light. For late and winter use, sow the seeds in open ground in May. Bleach by earthing up gradually as the stalks develop until you have the plants buried to within a few inches of the tip of their leaves. Use clean, dry soil in banking the plants. Sawdust is good, but care must be taken to make use of a kind that does not have a strong odor. Pine dust will give the plants a disagreeable flavor. For winter use, take up plants, root and all, and pack close together in boxes and store in a cool, dark cellar. White Plume is the best early variety. Giant Pascal is probably the most satisfactory winter variety, but Winter Queen is a favorite with many. Both are so tender and have such a rich, nutty flavor that it is not an easy matter to decide between them. Cucumber For very early cucumbers, plant the seed in the hotbed in March or April, but do not put the plants into the garden until all danger of frost is over. This plant requires a rich and mellow soil. It should be set in hills at least four feet apart. It is a good plan to start the seed in pieces of sod placed grass side down. This enables one to move them from the hotbed without any disturbance of their roots. The cucumber or squash beetle often destroys the plants when they are put in the open ground if close watch is not taken and prompt effort made to rout the enemy. Spray with nicoticide infusion, taking pains to have it reach the underside of the leaves. Dry road dust sifted thickly over the plants is often found quite effective, but because of the inability to apply it to the underside of the leaves, the liquid insecticide will be found more effective. Improved early white spine is a favorite with all who like a crisp, tender meated, finely flavored cucumber. Everbearing is an excellent sort for pickling as well as for use on the table during the fall, as it continues to bear until frost kills the vines. Corn. Sweet corn is one of the most delicious of all garden vegetables, and every garden that is large enough to admit of its culture should give place to two or three varieties of it. Because of its tall growth and the distance required between rows, it is not adapted to culture in the very small garden, though I would willingly go without some of the other vegetables generally grown there, in order to give place to a few hills of it. Golden Bantam produces ears only four or five inches in length but what they lack in size they make up for in tenderness and sweetness. Country Gentleman is a medium variety, very tender, sweet, and juicy. But the ideal sweet corn is Stowell's Evergreen. No other variety equals it in tenderness, sugary sweetness, and rich flavor. It does not come to maturity until quite late in the season, but it remains in excellent eating condition until the plant is killed by frost. Do not plant until the weather and the ground are warm, generally about May 10th at the extreme north. Sweet corn seed often decays if put into the ground as early as field corn. Have the soil rich and mellow, and cultivate it frequently and thoroughly. If a dry spell comes along, make use of the cultivator daily until the drought is broken. End of chapter 7, part A.
Chapter Seven, Part B of A B C of Vegetable Gardening. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Seven, Part B. Endive. This plant ought to be grown far more extensively than it is because it is one of the best salad plants we have for fall and winter use. Some should be sown in April for use during the summer, and some in July for late use. When the plants are two or three inches high, transplant to rich soil, setting them about ten inches apart. When nearly full grown, gather the leaves together and tie them with strips of cloth, thus excluding the light from the central part of the bunch. It must be blanched before it is fit for table use. This part of the work must be done while the plants are perfectly dry. If done when they are wet or even moist, they will be quite sure to rot. Lettuce. This plant should be started in the hotbed if there is one. The seedlings should be transferred to the cold frame before they have attained much size, and left there until the ground becomes warm. Very fine lettuce, however, can be grown from seed sown directly in the open ground about the first of May, if the soil is warm and rich. A fertile soil is quite important, as it is necessary to bring on a rapid growth in order to have the plant crisp and tender. Slow development gives a comparatively worthless article. The all-heart variety is excellent for spring and early summer use. It forms a solid head and is very crisp and tender, with that rich, buttery flavor that the lover of this plant insists on. Mammoth salamander is one of the best late-season kinds. Melons These, like corn and cabbage, are not adapted to culture in the small garden because they require more room than it is possible to give them without giving up other vegetables which the housewife cannot well afford to go without. But in good-sized gardens I would advise their culture, because there is nothing else quite equal to them in delicacy of flavor and luscious sweetness. They require a light, rich soil. Plant when the ground is warm, and not before, in hills four feet apart. It is a good plan to put a generous quantity of manure from the hen-house in each hill, working it well into the soil before seed is planted. Put at least a dozen seed in each hill, for some of the seedlings will doubtless be destroyed by the beetle that works on cucumber and squash vines. Spray all over with nicoticide infusion. As soon as the first beetle is seen, also shower with dry road dust. If a fungus disease attacks them, spray with Bordeaux mixture. Rocky Ford is the standard variety of muskmelon at present. It has a thick greenish-yellow flesh is smooth-grained, is very sweet, has a most delicious flavor, and is so tender that it fairly seems to melt in the mouth. Netted gem is another standard variety. Among the watermelons ice cream is a general favorite. Mammoth ironclad grows to a very large size, is solid-meated, and has a peculiarly sweet and luscious flavor. Onion. This should be sown in light, sandy soil, if possible as it seldom does well in a heavy soil. Yellow Danvers is the leading variety for the home garden. Silver skin has a mild flavor, and on that account is a favorite with many. It is fine for pickling. It also keeps well in winter. Parsley Sow this plant thickly, in April, in rows of mellow soil. As the seed germinates very slowly, it is well to soak it in warm water before sowing. If you have a light cellar, Plants can be potted in fall and stored there for winter use. The cellar window is a good place for them. Every housewife who prides herself on the attractive appearance of her roasts and other meat dishes and many kinds of salad will not be willing to be without this plant. Dwarf Perpetual is the standard variety for the home garden. Its leaves are charmingly crimped and curly, and of beautiful dark green that makes them very ornamental when used as a garnish for the table. Parsnip. This vegetable is not grown as much as it ought to be. One does not care for it until the winter sets in. Then it affords a much appreciated change from other vegetables. It is an excellent keeper when stored in the cellar in winter, or the roots can be left in the ground until spring, when they will be found delightfully fresh and tender. Sow in April or May in deep, rich soil. Hollow crown is the standard variety. P. This vegetable is so extremely hardy that it can be planted with entire safety quite early in spring. There are varieties that come into bearing a few weeks after sowing, 
followed by medium early kinds, which give place a little later to such varieties as Champion of England and Telephone. Champion of England is the most delicious of all peas. Unless the garden is a very small one, one should plan for a succession. If this is done it will be possible to enjoy this vegetable during the greater part of the season, with possibly the exception of the very hottest part of summer. Best results are secured by planting the seed two or three inches deep in furrows. The soil should be rich. If there is a little clay in it, all the better. Low-growing varieties require no support, but the tall kinds must be bushed or trained on coarse meshed wire netting. Bushes suit this plant better than anything else. If the vines are allowed to crinkle down and come in contact with the ground, their pods will almost always decay, and the vines will mildew and become so diseased that an end will be put to their bearing. American Wonder is one of the best very early kinds. Gratus is next in order. Advancer I consider the best medium variety. Telephone is a most excellent late variety, second only to Champion of England, which is everywhere conceded to be the ideal pea so far as productiveness, size, rich flavor, and sweetness are concerned. Potato Anybody can grow the potato after a fashion, but in order to grow it well it must receive more attention than is generally given it. It must have a rich and mellow soil, a sandy one is preferable, and the best of cultivation. This is one of the vegetables that require considerable room, therefore it is not adapted to small garden culture. But when space will admit of it, it should always be grown because it is one of the garden products that can be used in so many ways that the housewife finds it one of the things she cannot well get along without. Seed is obtained by cutting old potatoes in pieces, each piece having an eye or growing point. The pieces should be planted in hills four or five pieces to a hill, with hills two feet apart, covered to a depth of four inches. If plants are not watched while small, insects are likely to attack them. Spray with nicoticide infusion. Later in the season the Colorado beetle will be quite likely to put in its appearance. Then use Paris green, either in infusion or mixed with land plaster and applied in a dry state while the plants are moist from dew. If any fungus disease is discovered, spray with Bordeaux mixture. All these insecticides can be procured from druggists or dealers in agricultural goods, or they can be obtained from the dealer from whom you buy seed. It is well to plant this vegetable for a succession. One of the best early varieties is Beauty of Hebron, which matures in eight to ten weeks from planting. Early Rose is everywhere a favorite, as is early Ohio. Rural New Yorker is a standard late variety. Burbank's seedling is excellent as an intermediate sort. All the varieties named are of superior flavor, very productive, and sure to give complete satisfaction. Radish This most toothsome vegetable should be sown early, either in the hotbed or the open ground. If you have a light, warm soil and a location that is fully exposed to the sun, you can raise almost as fine radishes outside of the hotbed as in it, though of course not as early in the season. A crop will develop in five or six weeks from sowing. Plant at intervals of two or three weeks for a succession. Cardinal Globe is the standard early variety. Crimson Giant is a little later. Both have that crisp, tender, and juicy quality which makes the radish so universal a favorite. Icicle is a long-growing white variety, very crisp and brittle. This has the merit of remaining in condition for use longer than any other variety. Rhubarb. This plant likes a deep, rich, and rather moist soil. It should be planted in permanent beds about three feet apart. I would not advise attempting to grow it from seed. Get roots one or two years old. Victoria is a standard variety. Salsify. A vegetable that ought to be grown a great deal more than it is. Its popular name of vegetable oyster is not a misnomer, for it has a distinct oyster flavor. Many persons prefer it to the bivalve when it is cooked properly. Being hardy, it can be left in the ground over winter, or it can be dug and stored in the cellar along with parsnips and carrots for use in winter. So early. Squash Probably the best variety of summer squash for home use is giant crook neck. 
For winter use the Hubbard stands at the head of the list. These favorite vegetables require a rich soil. They should be planted in hills about three feet apart. Have the soil rich. Keep watch of them, for they are liable to attacks from beetles. It is well to sprinkle a handful of tobacco dust about the young plants. As they become larger they can be sprayed with the nicoticide infusion heretofore spoken of. Spinach Desirable for greens. Sow as early in the spring as the ground is in good working condition. Have the soil quite rich to force a tender succulent growth. Sow for succession a month apart. The long season variety is the best I have any knowledge of. Tomato Start this plant in the hotbed if you have one. If not, sow in the open ground as soon as it has become warm. To secure a very early crop, the plants must be started as early as March. When three or four inches high, transplant from hotbed to cold frame, but do not put into the open ground until all danger from frost is over. If you are without hotbed facilities, I would advise purchasing plants from the gardener who tries to supply his customers with strong and healthy plants very early in the season. Plants from seed sown in the open ground will be so late in ripening a crop, as a general thing, that they will not afford satisfaction. Standard varieties are stone, very solid and firm fleshed and of fine quality, and ponderosa, very large, fine flavored, and almost seedless. End of chapter 7, part B.